In this lecture, we'll look at some ways to use the principles we've learned about fitting linear models to learn nonlinear patterns. A few lectures ago, we saw one example of this. We saw that by expanding our features, adding new features derived from the old ones, we can learn new nonlinear decision boundaries or regression functions, despite the fact that we're fundamentally fitting a linear model. Both models we will see today, neural networks and support vector machines, take this idea and build on it. Neural networks are a big family, but the simplest type, the two-layer feedforward network, functions as a feature extractor followed by a linear model. So in this case, we don't choose the expanded features, but we learn them together with the weights of the linear model. The support vector machine, or SVM, doesn't learn the expanded features. We still have to choose them manually, but it uses a kernel function to allow us to fit a linear model in a very high dimensional feature space without having to pay for actually computing all these expanded features. The structure of today's lecture will be largely chronological. We will focus first on neural networks, which were very popular in the late 80s and in the early 90s. Then, towards the end of the 90s, interest in neural networks died down a little and support vector machines, and support vector machines became much more popular. In the next lecture, we'll focus on deep learning, which sees neural networks come back in a big way. In this video, we'll start with the basics of neural networks. In the very early days of AI in the late 1950s, researchers decided to take a simple approach. The brain is the only truly intelligent system we know, so let's see what it's made of and whether that provides some inspiration for intelligent and learning computer systems. They started with a single brain cell, a neuron. A neuron receives multiple different signals from other cells through connections called dendrites. We can think of these as its inputs. It processes these in a relatively simple way, deriving a new signal, which it then sends out through a single connection called an axon. The axon branches out so that this single output signal can reach different cells. These ideas needed to be radically simplified to work with computers of that age, but doing so yielded one of the first successful machine learning systems, the perceptron. This was the model we saw in action in the video in the first lecture. The perceptron has a number of inputs, the features in modern parlance, each of which is multiplied by a weight. The result is summed together with a bias parameter and the sign of this result is used as the classification. Of course, we've seen this classifier already. It's just the basic linear classifier we met in lecture two. The training algorithm used on the perceptron was a little different from the gradient descent we used in lecture two, but the basic principle was the same. Note, incidentally, that when we draw the perceptron this way, the bias can be represented as just another input that we just fix to always be one. This is called a bias node. Of course, the brain's power doesn't come from the fact that a single neuron is such a powerful mechanism by itself. It's the composition of many simple parts that allows it to do what it does. We make the output of one neuron the input of another, and we build networks of billions of neurons. And this is where the perceptron turns out to be too simple an abstraction, because composing perceptrons doesn't make them more powerful. And we'll look at an example to illustrate that. In this image here, we see three perceptrons, two on the bottom, whose outputs feed into a third perceptron on the top. We've omitted the bias nodes for simplicity, but the principle we're illustrating here also holds if you add bias nodes. If we take this graph and we write down the function that this combination of perceptrons actually computes, we see that y is computed according to the simple formula at the bottom. The bottom two perceptrons are inside the brackets and their outputs are fed to the top perceptron. If we multiply out the brackets, we get this function on the input features. And we see that in these four input features, this is also a linear function, which means that there is a single perceptron that computes this function, which we've drawn here. And this general principle always holds when you compose linear functions. No matter how many of them you compose and in how complicated a way, the result will always be representable by a single linear function. 
That is, you never get a more expressive function by chaining together linear functions. To create perceptrons that can be composed to be more than the sum of their parts, we need to introduce a nonlinearity. Here is a simple example, the logistic sigmoid that we've seen already. And the principle is as follows. We compute the perceptron as we did before, a simple linear function giving us a scalar output, and we pass that scalar through our sigmoid function. And the result is a value between 0 and 1. And with this simple addition, the perceptron becomes a nonlinear function. And composing together several perceptrons gives us functions that can compute more than any single perceptron ever could. Another common choice for the nonlinearity is what is called the ReLU function, which is even simpler than the sigmoid function. It functions as an identity for positive inputs, just returning the input. And for negative inputs, it always returns zero. Using a perceptron without activation function is sometimes also called a linear activation. And with this in place, we can start building networks of perceptrons. And the simplest option is a feedforward network. Any arrangement of perceptrons makes a neural network. But for ease of training, this arrangement seen here was the most popular for a long time. We arrange a layer of hidden units in the middle, each of which acts as a perceptron with a nonlinearity connecting to all input nodes. And then we have one or more output nodes connecting to all hidden layers. Note the following points. Firstly, that there are no cycles. The network feeds forward from input to output. Nodes in the same layer are not connected to each other or to any other layer than the next and the previous one. And each layer is fully connected to the previous layer. Every node in one layer connects to every node in the layer before it. In the 80s and 90s, feedforward networks usually had just one hidden layer because we hadn't figured out how to train deeper networks. And once we've wired up a network like this, we can use it to do classification or regression. And we'll start with simple regression. To build a regression model, all we need is one output node without an activation. This means that our network as a whole describes a function from the feature space to the real number line. We can think of the first layer of our network as computing a feature expansion, the same thing we did in the fourth lecture to enable our linear regression to learn nonlinear patterns. But this time, we don't have to work out the feature expansion ourselves. We simply learn it. The second layer is then just a linear regression on this expanded feature space. Given this model, we get an output, and to that output we can then apply any loss function we like, such as the least squares loss, and train the model by gradient descent. If we want to do binary classification, we can keep the model the same, except that we give the last node a sigmoid activation, just like the hidden nodes in this case. This means that the output of the network is always a value between 0 and 1, which we can then interpret as the probability that this particular instance that we fed the network has the class positive. And given these class probabilities, we can determine our loss by the logarithmic loss that we saw in the last lecture. And here again, we can think of the first layer as a feature expansion, in this case, taking our two features and expanding it into three features by some learnable parameters. And the last layer is a logistic regression on top of that expanded feature space. If we have a multi-class classification problem, we can use something called a softmax activation. Here we create a single output node for each class. So in this example, we have three output classes and therefore three output nodes. And we apply to these output nodes something called a softmax activation. This softmax function ensures that the output values over all classes always sum to one. It looks like this. We call the output nodes before the activation OI, so we get three of those. First, we take the exponent of all their values so that we can be sure that they are positive. And then we divide all of their values by the sum over all three classes so that we can be sure that all of them sum to one. This is called the softmax activation, and it means that we can interpret the output of the network as a probability distribution over the three classes. Given these probabilities, we can apply a simple log loss function. The aim is to maximize the logarithm of the probability of the true class.
So with that, we have neural networks for regression, for binary classification, and for multi-class classification. And for each, we can apply a loss function that we've already seen. So now the question is, how do we train neural networks? The answer is gradient descent, but with a slight change from what we've seen so far. Because neural networks can be expensive to compute, we tend to use stochastic gradient descent to train them. Stochastic gradient descent is very similar to the gradient descent we've seen already, but here we define the loss function only over a single example, instead of summing over the whole data set. We just use the same loss function, but we pretend that our data consists of only one instance. We then loop over the whole data set, and at every instance we see, we apply a small step of gradient descent using the gradient of the loss over just that one instance. We do this using multiple passes over the data. This is called stochastic gradient descent because we can think of this loop over the data as sampling instances from our data distribution and using those instances to compute a stochastic approximation of the gradient of our loss function. Stochastic gradient descent has many advantages, including the following. Using a new instance each time adds a little randomness to, to the process, which can help us to escape local minima. Gradient descent works very well if the gradient is not perfect, but good on average over many steps. This means that taking many small inaccurate steps is often much better than taking one very accurate big step. And computing the loss over the whole data is expensive. So by computing the loss over one instance, we get n steps of stochastic gradient descent for the price of one step of regular gradient descent. These days, the most common approach is a compromise between stochastic and regular gradient descent, where we actually compute the loss for a small batch of instances, say 32 of them. And we then take a single step of gradient descent for each batch. This is called mini-batch gradient descent, and we'll look at that more closely in the next lecture. For now, let's recap what we've learned. To train a neural network, to train a neural network, we need some examples of an input and an output, as we do in all offline machine learning. We need to define a loss function, which can be least squares or cross entropy. We need to work out the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. And then we apply stochastic gradient descent to improve the weights bit by bit. And we can see these principles in action in the TensorFlow Playground app. We've turned on all the features of the app so that it allows us to build a neural network. So we see here a neural network with a hidden layer of six neurons and two input neurons. We've turned on this spherical data set that requires a circular decision boundary or something approximating it, and that cannot be classified with a linear classification boundary. We can choose the activation of the hidden layer here. We see that there is a linear option for no activations, a sigmoid option, and a ReLU option, like we saw in the earlier uh, slides. And as before, we can set the learning rate and start the network training. And what we see first of all is that, we, that when we have no activation, that the neural network can do nothing but classify this with a linear decision boundary, no matter how complicated we make this network. If we set the activation to sigmoid, we can see if we check a few initializations, that the decision boundary is nonlinear. It draws a kind of curve in our feature space. We set the learning rate a little bit higher, and we started training to see what it comes up with. And there we see that after a while, it learns to draw a general sphere around our blue points, to separate our blue points from our orange points. We can also note that if we change from a sigmoid activation to a ReLU activation, the shape of the decision boundary changes. Where previously we had a curved shape, we now get a piecewise linear shape. So locally, all parts of the decision boundary are still linear, but it has these corners that change the shape of the boundary to allow it to fit nonlinear patterns. And when we set a training, we can observe two things. 
First, that with the ReLU activation, the network converges a lot quicker to a good solution. And secondly, that the solution is a kind of polygon, a piecewise linear approximation of a circle. And we see that for the other data sets, a network like this performs similarly well. And only for this spiral data set does it take a little bit longer for the network to figure out what a good solution might look like. So those are neural networks. But there's one question that we haven't answered yet. For models so far, like logistic regression and the basic linear classifier, we've always worked out a functional form of the gradient manually. The problem with neural networks is that they quickly become too complicated for us to do that by hand. We need to automate the working out of the gradient. And that's where the backpropagation algorithm comes in, which is what we'll discuss in the next video.